Heb jij de muis? Of? Ah, hier. Oh. Dus je code wilt laten zien? Je hebt één uur, dus je hebt 45 minuten voor de talk. Oh, okay. Perfect. Dus de code, dan moet je wel op dat scherm zien. Okay. Als je met de muis wilt doen. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this talk is about uh, the next iteration of uh, a GUI application. And the idea of this talk uh, originated two years ago here at EuroPython, where there was a talk about uh, iterators and generators. And at the same time, uh, we were developing the Camelot project and we had some troubles into developing it further uh, because the framework became more and more complicated internally and it became difficult for users to customize it. And this talk about um, generators, which was completely unrelated um, to graphical interfaces, gave us a lot of ideas on, on how to improve uh, our application. So now we will present what we did with those ideas and I hope this will inspire uh, everybody to think about the generators in Python and see how you can, you can use them in your application. So we will show you how to write a graphical interface as, a C, as, a, as generators, as a series of generators that you attach to each other. And we will show that the advantages of it is that you can develop applications that are user friendly, that are easy to write and that are easy to test as well. Maybe with regard to the previous presentation that is no longer necessary, but still. <laughs> so, if you think about a user interface, what is it actually? You can see a user interface as a game of table tennis between the user and the computer. So, interaction is going back and forth between both of them. If the user presses a button, he's, he sends the ball to the computer and the computer has to respond as soon as possible and send the ball back. So if you keep that, that mental image in mind, then what becomes the difficulty of developing a graphical interface? It is modeling this game of table tennis uh, between user and computer, modeling this game in code. So if you think that developing a graphical interface is as simple as just creating, taking a form creation uh, tool, designing a form, and then attaching some code to it and you're done, then I think that, um, that you have forgotten some details and we will talk about those details now. So during the talk, we will discuss uh, three requirements for graphical interfaces. The first requirement is the simplicity of development. If you develop an application, you want to keep it as simple as possible. So that, that's one requirement. The other one is, user friendliness. You want it easy for your users to work with it. And at the same time, you want to be able to test your application, to unit test it, to make sure if your application grows that um, it stays stable. And I think that if you cater too much to, to one of those requirements, the other requirements start to suffer. If you make your application too user friendly, it won't be simple anymore to develop. Um, 
if you want to test it too much, yeah, simplicity of development will suffer as well. So you need to make some, some trade-offs. So let's talk about user friendliness first. If you read the uh, OS X human interface guidelines, which are similar to those of, of, of GNOME or some other project, then you will, see, you, will, you will see some interesting sentences in this text. For example, they say you need to use a progress indicator for lengthy operations. Well, that's a nice idea, but how as a developer do you know which operations are lengthy? Your, your user can use your application with a completely different data set. If it's a scientific application, um, they can enter some numbers that make your algorithms go nuts. So you don't actually know what operation will, will, will be lengthy. So you don't know where to put a progress indicator. It says as well that you have to provide a cancel button for lengthy operations. Well, first of all, you don't know which are the lengthy operations. And how are you going to implement this cancel button? It, it's not easy either. It says that the application needs to respond to events within two seconds. Because if your application fails to respond within two seconds, users think the application is broken, it has crashed, and they will terminate it. So that's not easy as well. And then they say you have to use similar controls in similar places and, and other user interface elements. Well, if you design your application with a, with a GUI designer, it's also very difficult to keep the application consistent. So talking about these lengthy operations, yeah, people have thought about it for a long, long time, how, how to handle this. And there is a, a serious conflict with handling lengthy operations and the state of uh, GUI toolkits. So how are most GUI toolkits implemented? You have an event loop, and this is just a loop that handles all the mouse events, the keyboard events, the touch events. So the loop runs and it says, did something happen with the mouse? Okay, we do something, we update the screen, and that's just an endless loop. Um, now what happens? If you do a lengthy operation within this event loop, your application freezes. So you say, ah, that, uh, that's a problem of the toolkit. Huh? Those toolkits are badly designed. They should be designed differently. So uh, we need a toolkit where we can, from multiple threads, uh, write to the screen and update the interface. Well, such a toolkit is actually impossible to implement. People have been trying it since the 80s, and nobody succeeded in doing so. So there is a nice blog post uh, from this guy on the internet, which you can read. And it states basically that it's almost impossible to, to develop such a toolkit. So we have this event loop model that is used in uh, graphical toolkits. Now, this event loop model makes it very difficult to respond to lengthy operations. And there are basically two ways you can, you can handle it. Either way, you will integrate all your lengthy operations within the event loop. So every I.O. operation and things like that have to be integrated in the event loop. That's an approach that is taken uh, for a large part in, in the Qt library. It's also the approach uh, the Twisted Project takes. The problem with this approach is that, well, you need to, um, you can only use libraries that you can integrate within the event loop, which, is, which, is, uh, which reduces the set of libraries that you can use. The other approach is to write your application multi-threaded. Since you don't have uh, a graphical toolkit that is multi-threaded, you can consider writing your application multi-threaded, but then you have the risk of getting, getting stuck in the same tar pits uh, where those multi-threaded graphical toolkits got stuck in. So, all uh, difficult problems. Then there is simplicity of development. This is the mouse. Uh, mouse. Yeah. For example, this is this is some Qt code. Uh, it's C plus plus. And what you see in this code is you have here in C plus plus in Qt, they have the concept of signals, which is something that the user did or, or an event that happened and you connect it to slots. So on the one hand, 
you have your nice uh, object uh, oriented programming and then you connect signals and slots to each other that create a kind of spaghetti within your nice object oriented code and uh, you can say okay that is that's a fallacy of the of the cute toolkit which is badly designed but actually every toolkit is designed in in this way uh, either way it's signals and slots or it's callback functions it's always something like this and and it makes your code complex then there is testability how do you test a graphical interface well the classic approach is you take a tool which will automate the mouse clicks yeah so you can write scripts that automate mouse clicks you can execute your script test if the interface uh, is updated uh, the way you want it and things like that now that's not an easy task as well first of all it's in a different environment probably than the one you're writing your code in if your interface changes all your test scripts need to change it's a lot of work so um, to present our ideas in this talk we, we are going to develop a very simple application um, and then show you those three aspects uh, testing code, uh, ease, of, ease of code and um, ease of unit testing within this application okay. so this is a real world thing a client came to us and they said we have this application uh, to uh, manage our warehouse but it does one thing but it, it, it uh, doesn't work with scanners we want to use barcode scanners to do the picking in the warehouse so they have an order somebody goes into the warehouse he takes a scanner that's the step one he scans an item puts it on the truck and the scanner the data in the scanner must go into the application third-party software the third step would be in this this scanner generates a file simple text file we read in the file the person uh, verifies the data sees is this correct and then it will be imported in the third-party application now this uh, this kind of application can uh, can have some drawbacks it can freeze it could be that uh, you're waiting on IO it could be that the file uh, that the disk is not ready whatever the file is is not read in properly um, the third-party software uh, could 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 freeze your application uh, etc another issue you could have is exceptions so if you uh, read read a file from uh, from uh, the from a USB stick or something it could give uh, an, an exception um, the scanner uh, doesn't work properly uh, and gets the data mangled up or something uh, the user cancels which is not really an exception it's 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 expected behavior but you need to handle that and um, well so the file could be in the wrong format the, the, the user could 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 have uh, chosen the wrong file or something so that's uh, things that can go wrong I'll just show you now this application in action how we uh, conceived of it So, in this third-party software, the, there is a button which opens a file selector. That's all. You choose a file, picking list, which is basically name of the article and how many times the, the quantity that it was scanned. You select it, you get a screen, which, uh, which shows you what is going to be imported in the third-party software. You can edit it if you want. You can cancel it. You can say OK. It imports. And it finishes. 
That's all. So that's uh, basically the application we're talking about. Now let's see, if we want to uh, build it, what's the competition for, for GUI applications in this, uh, in 2013? It's still Visual Basic, visualbasic.net, and it's still Java. How would they stack up in our balance, in our matrix? First of all, Visual Basic. Well, Visual Basic is easy. It has a low threshold for new developers. It's just drag it onto the screen, add some functionality, you got yourself an application. But it's very hard to get it right. It's very easy to mess it up, to get your flow of screens out of order. To, to it's, it's hard to maintain. I guess preaching to the choir here. So. Um, and Visual Basic applications will freeze on separate, on I.O., on, on other parts uh, that you don't have control over. So, user friendliness, like I said, it will freeze. People will not know what, what's going on. Not very good. Testability. testability. You can test unit test uh, Visual Basic applications, but it's very hard. It's not easy to get it right. Simplicity of development, yeah, it's very easy. We'll give it that. So where does it come in our balance? I would say here. Not very user friendly, not very uh, good for testability, but very easy, very easy to, to build. So, next competitor. Yeah, and we'll have, a, we'll have a look at Java. So Java was designed by a, a large committee of, of really smart people. So that should be, should be perfect, actually. So let, let's have a look at how Java Swing works um, with, with uh, regard to lengthy operations. Cool. So Java also works with um, an, event, an event loop, of course. Uh, the whole uh, Swing uh, objects are not thread safe. So you have uh, also the concept of a GUI thread or an event loop thread which, in which all the swing stuff is done. And if you, have, um, if you want to, to do a lengthy operation, you have to send this lengthy operation to a worker thread, which, has, which is part of a worker pool or something like that. And the operation you send to the worker thread, um, it should extend swing worker. Yeah? Here we have... The swi some swing worker code and it has basically um, two important methods first method is do in background and there you have to do the lengthy stuff yeah and if this do in background is finished automatically the done method is called in uh, in the event loop and there you can update uh, the graphical interface yeah and in the done method, you have the get function. You can access the get function, which gets you the result of doing background. So in do background, you do your computation. And in done, you update the screen. That's, that's, that sounds like a fair approach, doesn't it? Well, how does it work when um, one lengthy process, one doing background, has multiple uh, results that you want to you want to update your ski your screen gradually, yeah. Instead of having a done method, you then have uh, you then have a process method which is also called automatically. So in doing background, you can publish your interim results, yeah, um, and you pick them up with. Um, with the process method, which gets chunks of the results. It's a list of, of results that it has to put on the screen. Yeah? And within doing background, you can also press uh, check if the operation was cancelled by the user. So you can abort the lengthy operation and um, you can continue doing useful stuff for the user. So that's, that's a fair approach of, of, of handling this, this problem. Um, what are the issues? One of the issues is, what if 
we didn't do in background, you come at a point that you say, I don't know what to do now. I need to ask the user a question before I can proceed. Yeah? Then you have to, you can't proceed, you're doing background process. You have to send some information to the graphical interface and then, yeah, pop up a dialogue or something um, and go back with another swing worker which has no longer the state of the previous swing worker. So it becomes a very complicated problem. Um, and what happens if within your doing background, you say, okay, I have branch one, and branch one updates this part of the GUI. Oh, but something else happened in branch two, I want to update another part of the GUI. That means that every time there is a branch in doing background, you need to uh, send this branching information to the process method so that it knows which part of the GUI it has to update. So that's not, that's not trivial either. So even it's, it's, while it's designed by a, a very smart committee, it, it's actually very difficult to, to develop uh, within this methodology. So if we, if we put Java Swing on our requirement uh, access, we'll see that in terms of user friendliness, it's actually perfect because the user can cancel the operation the lengthy operation takes place in another thread. It updates the GUI uh, gradually. So it's perfect in terms of user friendliness. In terms of testability, well, look it up on Stack Overflow how to test it. You, you, will, find, you will find answers that, that you don't believe. So it's, it's, it's incredi incredibly difficult to unit test. And in terms of simplicity of development, well, it's simple for the simple cases. But when your application becomes more complex, it's, it's no longer simple. Again, look, in, look on Stack Overflow, how to uh, cascade multiple workers and, and things like that. It becomes very, very difficult. So if we put Java Swing on our access, it's very user friendly, but it's very difficult to develop, very difficult to test. I, I guess that's why you don't see that many Java Swing applications either. Although the design is perfect. So now that we have taken a look at the competition, let's take a look at Python. Yeah? Python has some unique language features which make this prob these problems actually easier to solve. Yeah? The first one is the simple generators, which were introduced in, in PEP 255. And a simple generator, it's, it's a way of... Uh, of creating iterator generators very easily through the yield statement. So if we think again about this game of table tennis between the user and the, and the application, we can actually model this game as, as a generator. Yeah? We can see our application as a generator here, the game model. Suppose we're developing a simple game that asks questions to the user and sees if the answers are correct. Yeah? The application is the game model. The consumer is the game interface and, the, consu and uh, the consumer consumes our generator or application generator. So what does the application do? It yields questions to the user and the user uh, just prints those uh, questions on the screen. So if we execute this code, we get right, uh, yeah. Oops. Oops. Okay, very simple. Yeah? It just prints the questions on the screen that were yielded by the generator. Now that's that's not yet an application, right? Um, so then there is another PEP, which is PEP 342, coroutines via enhanced generators. And it changes the, the behavior of the generators a bit. It does these things. 
It redefines the yield keyword to be an expression. Yeah? So that means that the yield keyword can return values. By default, it returns, if you, if you, call, if you use the statement yield, by default, it returns none. Yeah? But this pep also adds the send method to your generator. So you can send information to your generator from the consumer. Yeah? And it also adds the throw method. So from the consumer, you can throw an exception in the generator. And it also allows the yield keyword to be used within try finally blocks. So let's let's rewrite this simple quiz application using this pep. Um, let's have a look at how the application itself is written. So we still loop over the questions. We yield the questions. We get the answer back from the user. If the answer is 42, it's correct. We increase the score. Yeah? And at the end, we yield a sentence with the score of the user. Yeah? That's the, um, the modeling of of the application. The modeling of the user loops over, um, it iterates over um, all the stuff that is yielded by the, by the application. It prints the text. Um, it asks an answer. If the answer is the character C, it says, okay, uh, the user wants to quit the application. We throw the stop iteration exception to um, to our iterator, and other oops, otherwise we send um, we send the answer to the uh, iterator. Okay, so how does this code work? Okay, so it asks the first question, what is the meaning of life? We know the answer, it's 42. Uh, what is the velocity of an unladen swallow? Um, African or European? Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know, so I will cancel the application. I press the C. So, there we are. Uh, stop it. So, what, what did the application actually do? When I pressed 42, this answer was sent to the, to the iterator. When I pressed C, an exception was raised in the iterator and the application exits. So, surely we can enhance this a little bit because you see here in the application there are actually two things we do. We send strings to the user interface and we ask the user interface for a response. So let's make this, this code a bit more generic. Instead of just yielding strings, we'll create some objects. We create an object that prints a line on the screen when you call its run method. Yeah? And we create an object that asks uh, for input when you call its run method. And then the application itself um, will simply uh, yield an object instead of a simple string. Okay. And then the uh, user interface will loop over the objects that are sent by the application and execute um, the, uh, the task. So we call these tasks and we, we execute them into the, into the interface. Whenever there is an exception, we send it to the iterator. So, exactly the same application. Okay, what is the meaning of life? 42. Velocity of a swallow? 42 as well. 
the holy hand grenade explodes on how many counts? 42. Yeah, and the score is 3. So we've built this application as a series of generators. Yeah? Now we did this for a command line application. We can do We can do exactly the same thing for a, a graphical in application. Um, you see, we can develop our application as an action which yields uh, uh, any number of action steps. For example, here is the, the definition of the application. It yields message boxes to the user interface and a message box uh, is an object which has a GUI run method, and this GUI run method does something in the GUI. Yeah? And then we feed the action uh, instance to a method called main action. Now, what does main action do? Um, it, it actually integrates this iteration process with the event loop, with the graphical interface event loop. So when you call main action, it uh, starts the, the event loop. Yeah? It starts a separate thread in which it starts iterating over the model run method. And every time the model run method yields back an action step, this action step is sent to the event loop, executed in the event loop, and the result is sent back um, to, uh, to the iterator, to the model run iterator. So Jeroen will now demonstrate how, how to build the previous application this way. as a series of action steps. So, um, I'll show you how we can do this in Camelot, which is the first time I think we are mentioning the framework. Camelot is the framework uh, uh, which uh, Eric built, which incorporates these principles. And you can see here how this is done. This is actually the code you saw running before. So this is working code. Keep in mind this simple data object. This is just um, some fields, two fields, article and quantity scanned. And you have an object admin which uh, describes how it, uh, what is displayed, so article and quantity scanned, and uh, which can, can give some uh, additional information. Quantity scanned is editable and is an integer, for example. So that's just the object we will be passing, which Eric talked about. Now the action itself, you can see here, contains a model run function. And this is really where the magic happen happens. So we ask, we ask the user for files. We uh, create uh, an action step called select file. And uh, it pops up the, uh, the, the message box. We tell it that you can uh, give it multiple files. And then we yield this, this step. If there are no files, we give a user exception, we give a pop-up file, and you say, we say, you haven't selected anything. Um, and then we uh, are going to go over the, the lines in the files. So for every file, we will open it. We will read every line. And then we will create these objects that I talked about, so these we will create a data object for every line and pass in uh, the article and the quantity. And then from these objects, these objects we will pass to another action step called change objects. And that is uh, the dialogue you saw where we can uh, adapt, where we can uh, review the data, where we can change the, the, the values, etc., and then uh, accept or cancel that. These objects, again, are looped over, and then something is done. 
Uh, in the meantime, we, at each step, we will uh, yield another action step, which is uh, update progress, which will uh, advance up the progress bar. So you can see it's really elegant. It's testable. It's, uh, well, it's easy to develop. Uh, it's easy to understand. Uh, and as you saw, it's easy to use. It never freezes. You can cancel it. You can edit it, etc. So as I said, Camelot is a, is, a, is a GUI framework which incorporates these principles. And out of the box, you have, uh, you have several of these action steps available. Um, let's see, You've, you saw the change objects. Uh, you saw the select file. We also have uh, a print HTML, which, is, uh, which, which displays the, the HTML. Um, we have the message box, which, uh, which you saw. Um, we've got a refresh, which refreshes all the data, all of, uh, which, which causes the, the model to refresh all the data. So a lot of stuff you can do. And these action steps, of course, you can create them as you, as you want. So for the uh, event loop integration, uh, two things I forgot to mention when uh, I discussed the uh, main method. What it does as well uh, while uh, the event loop is running, and if the um, there's too ma too long, uh, too many, uh, too large amount of time between two action steps being yielded uh, in the model run method, it will automatically pop up the progress bar dialog with the bar going back and forth to show the user uh, that the application is is active. Even though the operation in the model thread takes a long time, the user won't see an application that freezes. Another thing that the, that the uh, main method does is, if there is an unhandled exception in the model run method, it will pop up a nice dialog in front of the user saying something went wrong with the application. Okay. Maybe skip this. What is it? When you cancel contact, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So um, exceptions. You can you can get exceptions from from the user, uh, which which uh, would be uh, what is ex what you can expect. Something like he presses cancel. That's something uh, you have to handle. Um, so the GUI uh, can update the model about uh, uh, an exception like that. The user pressed cancel. Stop doing what you're doing. Other way around, this works in both directions. The model can also inform the GUI that there is something wrong. So this third party application crashes or something. The model knows this, sends uh, uh, a message to the user via the GUI, uh, user exception, something went wrong. So I'll just, uh, I can show you real quick. Again, what happens? It starts in this window. So again, I'll choose my picking list. Say open. Say, oh, this is totally wrong. Totally wrong file. Uh, I need to start over again. I have to inform the model that something went wrong, which is what we do. We cancel. So what actually happens is when the user presses cancel, at the next time your iterator uh, yields something, instead of returning a value, an exception will be erased within the, within, uh, within the yield statement so that you can cleanly uh, clean up uh, whatever you were doing. Which is also, uh, which makes it possible that uh, when you are going through the process, you can cancel it. At the next, next iteration, which is in the for loop, it goes out of, uh, out of, the, uh, out of the run. 
Hmm? Yeah. So, um, as you maybe saw in the um, in the um, in the implementation of the actions, the model run method has an argument which is called the model context. Now, what is the model context? It's actually it's what the user was seeing in the application, but uh, the references of those things in the model. Data preview. Hmm? The data preview. Oh, yeah. so. So if you have, for example, this screen, yeah, and you have here this, this export to Excel button, yeah, that's an action as well. Yeah? So if I press this export Excel button, the model run method of this action is called. And this, if I do so, okay, I first get a dialog where I can select the columns I want to export. I press OK, and the export is done. Okay, it appears on the other screen. Um, so, but this model run method, how does it know which objects it should export to Excel? These things are, are, are received through the model run, uh, through the model context. Good. So, good. so the model context, <coughs> yeah, the model context has a number of methods that you can use to get information about what the user was seeing. So you can, for example, call model context dot get selection. Then you get an iterator over the rows that the user had selected in his list. Yeah? If you call model context get collection, you get an iterator over all the rows that were in the list that the user was seeing. Yeah? There is another uh, method called get object. Then you get exactly that object uh, which was under the cursor at the time the action was triggered. The model context also has some, some handy um, variables or attributes like selection count, the number of rows that were selected, collection count, the number of rows that were in the list, because if you want to, uh, if you need to know this number to update your progress bar, and you have to first iterate uh, through all the collection, well, it, it, might, take, uh, it might take ages <coughs> just before you can, uh, you can display a progress bar. Okay, now to test this application, basically it's, it's very easy to test such an application. The only thing you have to do is... Test game mm -hmm. So to, to test such an application, the application is actually an iterator. So how do you test your code? You just loop over the iterator. So you call list on a call to model run, and the application is tested. That, that's how easy it is to test your application. Of course, you can make it now uh, more, a bit more sophisticated to see not just whether it works, but whether it actually does what you want to do. So, unit testing. We uh, uh, the approach we talked about uh, is is easily unit tested. Uh, I'll show you the code. So what we see here is. Uh, how you can uh, test the, um, the file importer. You can send it a file. Easy as that. And then you can go through the steps of the generator and you can uh, check what step you're on. And then, for instance, this step is the change object step where you can go into the objects and see if this is the object that you are, uh, that you are expecting. Um, this test also, you can use uh, the throw 
method on the generator to uh, see if the cancel request uh, gives any problems or not. <coughs> and this is 100% uh, test coverage, but yeah, what does that matter? <laughs> So the sweet spot, all this, where does that place Python and consequently Camelot on our balance? You guessed it, right in the middle. So it's very testable. It's easy to develop and the user gets everything that he wants. Okay. Now there is one problem with this approach and that is, um, Let me fill that. Let me. I like it. The the issue is what if you want to uh, combine actions together? Yeah, you have you have written a couple of actions and you want to combine them in one big action. For example, in our game. I have the ask questions action, which asks a bunch of questions. And then I want to integrate this action into my bigger game action. Yeah? So the obvious thing to do would be I create within my game action, I create ask questions. I call ask questions model run. I, yield over, uh, I loop over the returns. And I yield these steps as well. Um, now there is there is an issue with with this. Somebody knows the issue. No. Well, it is the passing of the answer. So when the user is going to answer the question, yeah, the answer will be the result of this yield step, yeah, and the answer will never get here. This will always be none, yeah. So. Fortunately, um, in Python 3.3, there is this, uh, this PEP 380, which allows us to, um, uh, to yield from uh, sub-generators. Slide? Yeah, I'll explain it like this. So if you have this, this uh, generator which you want to call inside another generator, you can just say uh, instead of looping over it and yielding the steps, you say yield from the other generator. And that solves the <coughs> passing of the return variables from, the, from one generator to the other one. It also solves the passing of exceptions in much the same way. Now, uh, if you're still stuck uh, with Python 2.7 instead of, of going to 3.3, um, there is a recipe on, on Stack Overflow, no, on Active State, which emulates PEP380. It's, it's a super generator. And what you have to do, you have to decorate uh, your outer generator uh, with this super generator decorator. And instead of calling, uh, of just typing yield from, you call a from function also from this library. Uh, so the syntax is more or less the same than, than what is proposed in PEP380 and it solves the same problems, but you can use it in, uh, in Python 2.7. Okay. Yeah. okay, so this is PEP uh, 380. So uh, this concludes uh, our presentation on, on developing GUI applications as a series of generators. I hope we, we have given you some, some inspiration to use this kind of things in your own applications. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. So the first question is, um, when the user cancels and the export is started, does it undo the things that have been already exported? Or um, well, in the example stops? application, it didn't do so. In a real application, you would start a transaction uh, right uh, at the first import state, where you do the first import, you start a transaction. Okay. And when the user cancels, you just um, 
yeah, undo the transaction and, and everything is, is and then and I think just a neat picking, but the the sweet spot of the Python in the middle looks yeah. like it doesn't do anything well because it's the, <laughs> it's the best is on the corner. Well, it should be yeah. like around everything. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> it's a, it's a trade-off. I mean, if you look at this way of developing the application, yeah, it's more complex than developing a VB application. So I'd say in terms of developer simplicity, it's it's maybe a little bit more difficult. Um, so it's it's a balanced approach that you need to take. Uh, it's it's the real life. Uh, we can't be perfect. Uh, yeah. So we. we Hi, thank you for, for the great talk. Uh, when you, you showed your first example, uh, I was just puzzled about the progress bar because you're iterating. Each yeah. time you're generating uh, a new progress bar. So I'm just wondering, I suppose there is sort of mapping under the hood for this, but if you have simultaneous progress bars, uh, how does that work? I mean, well, it, 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 it's always it, one task. It's now it's if you if you yield the update progress bar, mm -hmm. yeah the this action step actually will look if there is already a progress bar mm -hmm. and update the existing progress bar. Okay. So if I want two at the same time. Yeah, then, then you have to implement a new action step. Okay. Which so which will will do so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing I, I didn't get is when you have uh, sorry. Uh, when you have another kind of actions, uh, how the context get passed from one action to the other. You explain get collection, get object, and all this stuff, but you select this precise one, or new context, for example. Yeah, if, well, this, this context is something that, what we did in Camelot, we have implemented a context for a form, mm -hmm. a context for a table, and a context, um, I think, uh, for, a, for an editor, for a text editor. Mm -hmm. So. If you, if you have something else than a form or a table mm -hmm. or a text editor, you need to implement a new context mm -hmm. which takes the information from the graphical interface and makes it available to the model. That is, of course, it's a, it's a bit of tricky code, mm -hmm. but in, in say, in 90% of the cases, you have enough with a table and a form okay. uh, to do this kind uh, of thing. Uh, and just, um, how do you decide between um, passing some information from one action to the other, yeah. instead of getting a new context, how do you decide? Uh, well, um, yeah. Well, you get, when, when your main action is triggered, you, mm -hmm. you, you get a certain context mm -hmm. which you can pass through, this, through the other actions that you call. If you need more information that is mm -hmm. not available in that context, mm -hmm. uh, you can use an action step mm -hmm. yeah, that, that goes, goes to the GUI. Mm -hmm gets the information that it needs and, and passes it back okay. to the model. I get it. Thank you. Uh, possibly a little theoretical question. So there, is, uh, so there is a single responsibility principle that you may want to follow and in your functions you kind of mix in two things together. Uh, do you consider this not as complication but, but as some kind of unavoidable coupling that is nicely presented because you have this feature in the language. Do you consider this as a coupling of code or not? You mean as a coupling between the GUI and the model code? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it certainly is a sort of coupling, but, but it's a coupling that is needed if, if you develop like, like the be Like the best of the worst, yeah, so to say. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. and typically in UI frameworks it's not the best of the worst, but... If towards the other end, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you if you take a look at the VB applications, you will see that, you know, you then you draw an, a button on the screen, uh -huh. and then you click that button and you type some code uh -huh. that modifies the model. Uh -huh. uh, it's actually whole. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole mess of, of but with no separation between uh -huh. your model and your GUI. And here, this so integr uh, the the connection between the model and the GUI is nicely put into this action. So yeah. it's a balance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great talk. 
actually. Uh, so I would like to ask about PyQt4 and uh, Camelot. Cal yeah. How are they related? Does Camelot require PyQt4 or can be used with another uh, like graphics GUI type of library? Or it's it's tied to uh, PyQt. Yeah. Um, for the moment, <coughs> it's tied to PyQt4. You can as well use PySite. Um, and well, in an experimental branch, we're supporting Qt5, but that's uh, that's experimental for the moment. Now I'm puzzling a little bit about uh, modal dialogues. You you had one big window, and then you press one button, and another window opens on top of it. Yeah. And if if there is basically just one big iterator which which yields these actions, how how do you configure? whether or not the window should block the other window or not? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Um, within the, um, the, the, the event loop code that handles the generator, yeah, it makes a distinction between two kinds of action steps. You can have a blocking action step and a non-blocking action step. The non-blocking action step never returns something. It just executes the code in the GUI so that your model code can continue to run as fast as possible and with a blocking action step you will first it will first wait until something is done inside the GUI and then get the result back um, to the model so there is actually you have two kinds of action steps uh, in the code yep. okay thank you very much um, thank you yeah I think there is the coffee break right now, yes.